Hello and welcome to Monet Cafe. I'm artist Susan Jenkins. We're gonna have some fun today and if you're new here, please subscribe and hit that little bell icon to be notified of future videos. This is part two of this night owl painting, complete with fireflies. I will have part one in the description section of this video. Now, if you saw the last video, and I highly recommend going back and watching that one, you are aware that I'm trying to do a new format with a lot of real time. So I am breaking them up into um, smaller, more manageable teaching sessions. And uh, I think, uh, I know actually, you guys have given me some good feedback on keeping a lot of real time. So I'm gonna do a little recap here. I'm working actually on a piece of watercolor paper. And I love the fact that pastels can be used on multiple surfaces. And I have so many videos that give uh, recipes and suggestions for how to save money and make your own pastel surfaces. So this is a piece of watercolor paper where I have used a recipe that I came up with recently with clear gesso and marble dust. And so that is what has given the um, surface of the watercolor paper enough grit for the pastel to hang on to. I did do a watercolor underpainting uh, for this painting and then I applied the coating over it to start applying the pastels. Once again, go back and watch part one if you're interested in that process. Now, this was an owl that I did and I it was kind of one of those spontaneous moments. I just kind of wanted to paint something and my husband was watching TV and I, I found a beautiful owl and the rest of it's from my imagination. And I realized, wow, I really enjoy doing this. So I'm giving you that as a heads up. The next owl painting, I'll show you a little picture of that cute little guy at the end of this video. I did a much more in-depth tutorial with lots of instruction and I'm really gonna break that one down so it will be more of a step-by-step -step video and um, hopefully easier than this one. So this was kind of a precursor to the next one. But I just, I like to share what I'm working on with you guys because I know some of you are interested. So now let me talk a little bit about what I'm doing. Notice that in some areas I've covered most of the surface with the pastel, but down in this area I'm working on with this tree branch, I had the idea to have the branch kind of going forward into the painting, creating depth and have this little mouse on it. So, um, so notice how the pastels that I'm applying right now, it still looks very textural. You notice all that white space or light space still showing um, between the pastel strokes that I'm making, but I'm not worried about that at this point because I know that I'm going to do a little technique that I did to blend the areas to the left of my hand, those dark trees. And um, so I'm, it's actually just a little piece of chamois cloth, you'll see me use it later, where I get my basic colors and values in and then I go in and blend it. And the reason I do that is one to, I don't always do that, sometimes I like the texture of the paper showing through in certain artwork, but this was a very dark scene in general. It's nighttime. So I know that the majority of my surface is going to be a darker value, much darker than the light areas that you see to the right there. Now I'm using the same um, brownish kind of uh, color of a pastel that I used on the main trunk there to get just a little bit of it on those trees um, that I'm working on right there. The reason I'm doing that, I don't want to overdo it, is because I'm keeping the light source in mind. The same thing happens with a night painting as you do with a day painting. You consider the light source and it's really going to affect all the values and colors that the light source affects. So I know that the moon is going to affect the areas kind of straight down from it and radiating out from it, but it's not going to get so much down into the depths of those trees to the lower left um, so they're going to stay much darker. Now, I also have to consider when it's nighttime and there's not a lot of sunlight, we just have a moon glow, things are going to blue out. They're not going to be as warm. So that's why I don't want the tree trunk, even though this is the one that's kind of in the direct path of the moon, I don't want it to be so warm in color temperature. Um, now, if you've seen my video, five ways to increase depth in your artwork, um, that is a great one for, especially if you want to do things out of your imagination, like I'm doing here. I'm just basically using those rules. I know that it's a cooler type of light. I know there's not a lot of sunlight, so I've just got to cool the temperature off. And even though I know, um, like I shared in the last video, 
Typically, color temperature is warmer in the foreground and gets cooler in the distance. In this case, yes, it will be a little bit warmer on that closest tree trunk under the mouse, um, but it's still going to be cooler overall because it's nighttime. So that's why I'm using this really um, neutral, pretty blue right here. And my colors at this point, if you saw the final, the final painting at the beginning of the video, it did have much more vibrancy. But right now I'm keeping it um, very neutral and darker in value. And once again, I'm working from my imagination, so I'm kind of like going, hmm, does this work? Is this what I want? Um, and the way I'm doing the tree branches, um, again, if I don't have a source to work from, which I didn't here, I'm using basically the, when you, when you paint a lot, you kind of understand how trees work. I'm not saying I'm an expert at it, but I've, I've done enough to know kind of how the branches uh, go. And also, if you're familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, there is a pattern to how trees grow and branches extend from the trees. There's a, a mathematical sequence. And while that might sound like, oh, math, art, I don't want to do math. I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. <laughs> it's not that hard once you learn the rules. And I do have another video on that. It's called the Golden Ratio and the Grand Design, I believe. And it really goes into a lot about the uh, Golden Ratio and the Fibonacci sequence and how it's just so beautiful in nature and how as artists we can embrace it and use it to our advantage when we're painting. And I know a lot of times we're not painting from imagination, but uh, a there are often times when you may want to alter a reference image. You don't like where this tree is leaning and you might want to remove it or you might want to add a branch here or there. And so learning these things is only going to make you a better artist. Plus, I just think it's interesting. I think it's so cool, this order and beauty that we have that just creates such natural harmony in our world. All right, so once again, I am just kind of really wanting those trees down there. I, I even blend them even more and darken them even more because what I'm trying to do Oh goodness, I have another video I'm going to solicit here. <laughs> I think it's five ways, uh, five techniques for focal point or something like that. What I'm trying to do is, what would you say is the focal point to this painting? It's that owl, right? So if I give too much intricacy and detail to the trees that I'm working on now, it's going to dramatically pull away the focus of the owl, which is what I I want the focus to be on is the owl. So even though, you know, you see me working kind of strategically here, I'm even going to dull this out even more and give just enough interest with color and value to suggest that there are trees receding into the distance. We don't need all of the information there when we are painting. And I think early on, I didn't realize this. I remember I was I, was, I had okay drawing skills, I, I, you know, I was, I was doing all right, but I didn't really understand um, these strategies that you can use when painting in creating interest where you want it to be and um, dulling or neutralizing or taking the focus away from other areas. And I remember I did this one painting of a tree and I think I must have painted every single leaf on that tree. And I, I felt so proud of it when I was done and then it was later that I realized you know it's there's too much information here what's that TMI expression that they use and so don't uh, let your painting suffer from TMI too much information we need to choose what it is that is the um, the thing that attracts you to what made you want to paint it and in this case it was this owl and and also the beautiful backlighting behind his wings. And if I was to paint so much detail in other areas, it would distract or take away from the main point of the painting, which is the owl. So that's why other things are very subdued. Now, and when it comes to the leaves and things you see me using now, I'm using a warmer color, which is a, a green, and I'm going a little darker in those trees that I'm working on right there because they're they're in a darker area they're not directly under the moon there's lots of other foliage back there so I'm limiting the warmth and keeping the uh, value a little bit darker but in the part that I did like behind the mouse that those greens are going to be a little bit warmer because of the moonlight uh, being more 
in a direct path to the moonlight. So you're going to get more warmth. You're going to get lighter values near your source of light. And plus it worked in my favor because the mouse is also too kind of a focal point. Um, now, when it comes to like some of the things I'm doing now with the greens and making the leaves, once again, remember what I said before about just suggesting things. And again, it's amazing what our brains will put together as believable without much information. Um, now I'm adding a little bit of those greens back in there. I don't need to really spell out, so to speak, every branch and tree back there because again, your, your brain's gonna go to the owl and then it's gonna play around. And actually, when we can learn to paint in a way that is actually the same way our eyes work, our perception works, because typically if we're looking at something, if this was a real life scene and you look at this owl, your peripheral vision isn't really focused on the things around it. it it's like a halo where things get gradually less focused as they extend out from your your focus, what your eyes are focused on. So that's why the things gradually just get a little blurrier around the edges. And I often say this, photography, it sounds like a strong statement, photography lies. <laughs> and I don't wanna say it lies, it captures too much information. It suffers from TMI. Because often, unless you adjust your settings on your camera, a lot of the automatic settings are set to make focus of everything. That's not how we see. We see the way I was mentioning before, where we, we center in on a focal point and then a little bit of blurring for our peripheral vision. So when we can learn to paint the way we actually see, we're going to have uh, more beautiful artwork and I think more painterly and interesting artwork. All right, now I'm using some purples here because purples are great for shadows and for cooling things off. And once again, this is a night painting and things in the shadows are going to be cooler in color temperature. We don't have the warmth of the sunlight. We've just got a little bit of a moon glow and thus we'll stay more on that cool side of the color wheel. Greens are going to lend themselves to be more teal and reds are gonna lend more towards violets and purples. That's why in those trees to the uh, lower left, I have, a, I have purples and more violets for uh, what would in the daytime be browns, you know, and reds and golds. And so, you know, that's an, an interesting strategy you can take, if, especially again, if you're working from imagination or if you're altering a photo, you're taking a daytime photo and you wanna change the color palette or the mood. These rules just work so well and they're really not all that hard. Once you learn some little tips and tricks of the color wheel and how things really work in nature, um, you can get so exploratory and creative with your artwork. The recent homework assignment I had for my patrons on my Patreon page was uh, every Friday I have a PE lesson. It's called Patron Education PE lesson. And I have them do a little um, something to kind of hopefully give them some more education artistically and stretch them artistically. And then they do the lesson and they submit it to a homework album that we have. I love that. I love going and seeing their homework that they submit. Oh, by the way, if you'd like to become a patron, it's only $5 a month. It supports this channel so I can keep free videos coming, helps me have better equipment, all kinds of things. And also you get a little bit of extra instruction and kind of become part of my Patreon community. Um, but anyway, back to the lesson. Last Friday's lesson we did where I, I gave them a painting demonstration, but I um, had them paint from black and white photos I provided them. So they didn't see the actual color photo and they had to use these rules like I was saying with the color wheel and, the, and values how values work and I got such great feedback from that one lesson from my patrons they really liked it and they felt like they learned a lot and learned that they can uh, reinterpret photos if they want and it and some of them even said I'm gonna do this more in the future where you convert your photo to black and white and just work from the black and white photo so uh, so that's really neat now I'm working on the little mouse here and I often get asked if I use pastel pencils much and I don't now I am going to use a pastel pencil for some parts of this mouse in a minute but uh, I often find that even with these chunky pastels I can find a little edge or a little corner 
And when you, to me, when I do that, I, I like Im more impressionism, and I think it lends itself to impressionistic artwork more um, when you use the pastels versus the pencils. But there are times when something is so teeny, like when I had to kind of reestablish those owl's claws. That was back in part one of this. Um, but anyway, and I apologize, um, the pastel's so big and the mouse is so little, you can't really see as much of what I'm doing here. But my strategy here <clears throat> is to get in the values. I know the mouse is going to be kind of a brown. Uh, or grayish mouth, mouse and I do gray him out a little after this but um, I'm just getting in the basics right now so I'm just using my little corners and I'm I know that because the moonlight is from behind um, and up high he's gonna have lighter values on top and darker values underneath now he did have a little white belly and while you may have, you'll see me in a minute, what color would I use to paint a white belly on this mouse? So I'll leave that as um, suspense until I get to it. <laughs> now I was working on um, the little shadows in his ears and I think trying to establish his eye. And in a minute, I actually go to a pastel pencil to kind of reestablish. No, that was just his eye. And so this was kind of painstaking, tedious work. Um, I do make... Um, a little bit of this uh, darker kind of a brownish magenta color and what I'm having to do here once again working from imagination is just use the rules that I know that's how they work in nature and it's so neat as artists that we're we're not reinventing the wheel with a lot of things we're just using what laws of physics are really there in our world I skipped ahead just a bit because there's a lot that you can't really see in this. Okay, so now, see this color that I got? The little lavender? Now that's the color underneath his little belly that I'm going to use to represent the white. Why would I use lavender instead of white? Well, uh, and now I'm using a darker purple to create a little bit more of a shadow underneath him and kind of ground him onto that tree. He needs to have a little shadow, a little darker area, um, so that purple really works well for shadow. But back to my question, why would I use a purple or lavender instead of white? In considering his environment, he's in a darker environment. White's not going to show up great, except for this owl with his wings because the moon is just shining right through his wings. And the little white on his belly, it's on the underside of his belly. So it wouldn't be natural or normal for that white to appear that way. And I know our brains play tricks on us sometimes. Often we can, as a beginner artist, we, our brains will tell us something is white and that's what we'll do. We'll just go grab white. And if we actually really analyze the photo or the subject matter, um, we'll discover that, wow, things are not the same color or value that our brains initially tell us. I learned this from working in Photoshop um, with my graphic design background. And I realized when I had to do some adjustments to photographs, uh, I would use a, a tool, it's called a color picker, and I would grab a color um, that I needed to use in another area, and I would often be like, wow, I had no idea, like people's teeth, for example, um, they, you would think you would just paint them white, but if you've done any portrait work, you know that usually, even if someone's smiling, their upper lip is creating a shadow over their teeth, and usually teeth are not really all that white so we need to learn to analyze and pay attention to what we're painting rather than making assumptions is probably the best way I can put it I want to say don't let your brain get in the way but it's really our brain often uh, tells us to assume something and uh, often it's not really the way it appears in nature all right so still working on this little mouse you can see I'm adding um, his little feet uh, I was just thinking of him having like a little pink nose and little pink feet and once again this is kind of a warm color uh, which is not really something in this scene that would have a lot of intensity uh, but I'm, I'm kind of using a little artistic license just to make him cuter here and here's where I'm using a pastel pencil. It's kind of a dark, dark purple. It looks black, but it's really like a dark purple. And just because he was so small and there were some areas that I just couldn't find the right corner of the pastel, I wanted to give him a little bit more detail and uh, darken up some areas underneath for shadows and, um, and just kind of uh, use it to get the values darker in certain areas. 
I did work on the mouse a little bit more after this, but not a lot. Like I said, I just darkened the values. But I wanted to show you another little blending tool uh, that you can use, Pan Pastels. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't done a lot of videos on Pan Pastels, but I do like them. Um, they have some neat tools. They're, pan Pastels are literally little pans of pastels. Like they almost look like a makeup compact, like you have powder in. And you have all these neat little tools for blending and applying them, actually really like a paintbrush application. And again, because this mouse was so little, my chamois cloth, I would have had a little bit uh, of a hard time um, getting kind of in those little areas in between his feet and under his tail. Uh, but notice that I'm using it kind of to blend in some of the, take the white out or the lighter values and, um, give a more smooth application. Uh, once again, there wouldn't be a lot of this white showing, even though sometimes I do like the texture showing like this. So um, I'm also just kind of using it, you see me mark on the side to the right there. When I'm using a dark value and I don't want it to get onto a lighter value, I'll just, it's almost like cleaning it off a little bit. Um, but I do add, now that I'm still just kind of in this blending mode with this tree, trying to create that sense of depth. Obviously, one of the things that creates depth, as you know, would be larger in the foreground, which it is, and it gradually recedes due to the laws of perspective. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm blending now, but I do go back and add a little bit more detail um, to that before the painting is done. Now, in this next part is where I'm doing my little technique for adding the fireflies. And in this video, once again, I apologize, not as much of my filming took place as in the next owl video I'm going to share with the cute little owl with the big eyes. So in that video, I'm going to do real time zooming in, showing you my little firefly technique. Um, and again, this was just kind of an overview and I didn't capture every single bit of footage here. So you'll see this technique in the next OWL tutorial. And now I wanted to zoom in because I'm uh, getting back to those background trees again. I'm doing what's called negative painting. And it's similar to a video I did not too long ago on what's called sky holes. It's really you're carving into your trees rather than drawing the limbs and branches. Now I have sped this up at this last portion of the video, but thus far it's been about 20 plus minutes of real time. So that's what I'm trying to give you guys more. Again, breaking the videos up to make them more manageable for uploads. And then I will combine them all together in a playlist so that you can see the whole series of painting videos in one session if you would like. Um, so once again, this is part two. I will combine it in a playlist with part one. And now I'm using a new pastel spelled N-U pastel, not N-E-W, made by Prismacolor. These are great harder pastels and they're better for like linear work. Now, remember the areas I was saying that you don't have to focus on drawing every leaf, just some shapes and values. Now I'm just going in and giving a bit more suggestion with some purples that are showing more shadowy areas behind some of the, the groupings of leaves, adding some of that purple in the branch um, that the mouse is on and also in the mouse and giving a little bit more color where the light of the moon is shining because that's how it would really work in nature. And Another neat thing to do is start examining nature. Start. Uh, I, I found that when I started painting seriously, I started seeing the world with new eyes. Has that ever happened to any of you guys? You're, you're like, wow, I'm, I'm observing things so much more. I just love the artist spirit of how we are really appreciating um, our world and our earth and God's creation and nature so much more than um, probably non-artists do. Um, so anyway, that's, I just think that's a neat thing about being an artist. I do apologize that I get, didn't get as much footage of the actual part of the owl painting. I am adding a little bit of purples and blues. Once again, his face and his body underneath side are really on the away side from the moon. So they're going to be cooler and have more shadows. And I chose to use like some purples, like even under his feet there and some cool like minty greens, even though the bodies of the, the body of the owl is white that part that's under his head 
if I painted it white, it wouldn't be true to the laws of um, color and value. That's just not how it works. So that's why I gave him more of that minty greenish, bluish color on his underside. And once again, I apologize I didn't get as much owl footage on this one, but the next video, I've got it from start to finish. So, and by the way, I'm finishing this one up here. I'll show you the final. And this painting is available in my Etsy shop along with the next owl painting I'll do. I'm trying to provide my paintings in my Etsy shop as soon as I finish the video. So here's the final. I hope you enjoyed this. Get ready for this next cute little owl tutorial coming soon. And of course, happy painting.